Hello and welcome to UWO Now. I'm your host, Wendell Ray. UWO Now is a place where we discuss relevant and interesting topics with the students, staff, and faculty at the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh. And let me just kind of set up today's uh, conversation with you. It was about 30 years ago that uh, Barney and Friends came out. Barney, if you remember, is this lovable purple dinosaur. Uh, and I remember about a year after that, a movie came out. Uh, I had not seen a trailer, but there was uh, a lot of good buzz about it. It was a Steven Spielberg movie about dinosaurs. And I remember thinking at the time... Why would Steven Spielberg want to make a Barney movie? You know, that was my reference. I was only thinking in terms of Barney. Because uh, before this, dinosaur uh, and movies really didn't, you know, didn't look that great. You know, I'm thinking about Flintstones. So, you know, when, 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 when they came out, I decided to take my nephew and my niece, who were about eight or nine years old at the time, having no idea what the movie was going to be about. And so I took them, and about a half hour into the movie, uh, a T-Rex has an attorney for dinner. And I remember thinking, literally thinking, this is not Barney. And I remember thinking, okay, my nephew and niece are flanking me on either side. And I'm thinking, oh, do I need to get up and take them out of here now? I don't, I don't know what the rest of the movie is going to be about, but I remember looking to my left, to my right, and my nephew and niece's eyes were like, saucers not because they were scared but because they were so into this movie and flash forward about 30 years now to the current time and and my niece is an adult and we had a family gathering about a month ago and she mentioned that as being something she remembered from her childhood because she loved that movie so much and there have been subsequent movies you know it's a franchise now so forth and so on and we're going to talk today about dinosaurs and that whole era of this earth that really, to this day, still captures everyone's imagination. You mentioned dinosaurs. People stop and look. There's dinosaur exhibits that are always sold out. And here to tell us a little bit more about how he loves dinosaurs and what he does with dinosaurs is UWO Associate Professor of Geology, Dr. Joseph Peterson. Thank you so much for being with us here today. Glad to have you. So, so so glad to have you on the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. So, tell us about how you what 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 is your um, what is your what is your connection to, to to dinosaurs? How did you get involved in in this? Um, same way your niece and nephew. Uh, I mean, in, in in all reality, I um. As a little kid, I went through a dinosaur phase. I think a lot of kids do because these are, uh, you know, they're movie monsters that you find out, oh, they actually used to be around. Yeah, right. Um, and there's that that interest that a lot of kids have with with you know monsters and something that can scare you, but this is safe because they're 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 gone. Um, and so, really, my interest as a, a little kid was was more in special effects, you know, horror movies, and science mm-hmm. fiction movies, and how did they make them. So anytime a, like a cool new effects movie would come out, I'd want to know more about how they did it. And yeah, 1993, Jurassic Park came out. I really didn't know much about it either. I knew, you know, you know okay. dinosaurs, but I, I I had read about how this had all these cutting, you know, cutting edge special effects. It was one of the first movies to use a lot of computer animation on, you know, an organic, you know, character, not yeah. just, you know, a machine or something. Exactly. And so I went and saw it opening day, June 11th, 1993, Rockford, Illinois, and went back to the theater three more times that summer. Mm-hmm. And it's, I've never gotten out of it. Um, and I mean, it's it's funny because looking back now, as the science has progressed, we know that a lot of the stuff in Jurassic Park is not accurate. But at the time it was. A lot of that was what we thought about uh, dinosaur biology at the time. And that's because they brought in paleontologists to be technical experts mm-hmm. in, in that, especially that first film. Um and and you're right. Before Jurassic Park, you know Barney, Land Before Time, <laughs> yeah, right, you know, yeah. the old Godzilla movies, King yeah. Kong, and stuff. Exactly. Dinosaurs were big, dumb, slow lizards that hung out in swamps, um, and they were they were the 
the go-to symbolism of failure. If something was old and decrepit, it was a dinosaur. And Jurassic Park made them alive, and they were fast, and they were smart, and they were they were animals. Yeah. It showed them as animals. And I think that's what it was that really captivated me about it is seeing these extinct organisms that I had only seen just bones in museums brought to life in a way that I, had, along with anybody else, had ever seen before. Um, so the more I started reading about the special effects of the movie, the more I started learning. You know, the science behind this is a lot more interesting, mm -hmm. and I've just never – Never gotten out of it. So there, there's a parallel universe out there where I'm like a special effects guy. But in this one, <laughs> this is what I'm doing. <laughs> well, tell us, what what are you doing? What are uh, what do you do uh, in terms of uh, researching uh, dinosaurs? What is your – your specialty is not in classifying dinosaurs right. necessarily, but you, you, you still are involved in – Digs and that sort Absolutely. of thing. Tell us, tell, tell, tell everyone what it is that you actually do. Yeah, so most of my research focuses on uh, two main areas with dinosaur paleontology. Uh, the first of all is what we call taphonomy, which is a fancy word essentially for um, dinosaur crime scene investigation. It's trying to reconstruct what happened from the moment this organism died to the moment we find it, you know, weathering out of a rock in Montana or Utah. And so that involves understanding how geology works, how erosion works, how, what can happen to an organism's remains after it dies. And some okay. of it's really interesting, like what can happen chemically to a bone after it's been buried. And some of it's a little more uh, gruesome, you know, like how scavengers will do what they do with mm -hmm. a carcass and s scatter pieces around. Uh, and then I also look at um, weird things on bones, essentially, like injuries. Uh, and what can we learn about an extinct animal's behavior from their injuries or from traces they're leaving on other bones. Uh, so in some, some cases, it's not as much the anatomy of the animal, but it's looking at a trace they've left behind or something unique on their skeleton that tells us more about something they did when they were still alive. And you spend a lot of time in Utah, is that yeah. right? Now, yeah. what is the big deal about Utah? Uh, clearly, there's a lot of bones there, but why? Um, back in the Mesozoic era, so like the time period when dinosaurs, uh, the, the non-bird dinosaurs were alive, um, you know, in the Jurassic and uh, Triassic, Jurassic and Cretaceous periods, that portion of the continental United States was relatively close to a coastline. Um, so you have a lot of rivers and lakes, and that's what you need to increase your chances of becoming a fossil is you have to be buried quickly. So, so it doesn't mean that there weren't dinosaurs in Indiana, oh, Wisconsin, no. Illinois. They, they were hanging out here. They were walking through. They were living and dying here. But we don't have the geologic record here of them anymore. Glaciers, we can thank glaciers for that when they came okay. up, you know, 100,000 years ago or so and stripped everything away. Um, but in, in Utah, we still have a, a it's incredibly complete record from like the dawn of the dinosaurs in the Triassic period all the way to the end of their – their reign at the end of the Cretaceous period. And so Utah is probably the, the number one spot in, in the United States uh, when it comes to, to dinosaurs. And the, the particular site that I've been working at with my colleagues in Pennsylvania uh, and our students um, is near Price, Utah. It's in Jurassic National Monument at a site called the Cleveland Lloyd Dinosaur Quarry. And it's been known for about 100 years now. Um, and we have three times as many predators there as we, we have prey. There's been somewhere between ten to 15,000 bones from this one site. And you're able to distinguish predator mm -hmm. from prey how? Um, predatory dinosaurs, or what we call theropods, the meat-eating dinosaurs, have a really unique characteristic uh, in their limbs. So their, their thigh bones and their you know, arm bones and so on. Uh, the bones are hollow. And this is just like modern-day birds, which are their descendants. Uh, so modern day birds are. So that's not a theory anymore. That's, that's more that's, accepted. That's pretty pretty well accepted at this point. I mean, we've even we have uh, theropod skeletons from a hundred million years ago that have feathers on them. Ah, so okay. the the hard part now is drawing the line between what's a bird and what's a non bird dinosaur. So the the way that we are related to primates is the same way that birds and T Rex are related. They both are are in the same very large and sprawling family tree. Um, but you were saying that predators yeah. and prey are different from their by the you can tell them by their bone structure. Yeah, the bone structure is really quite unique. Um, but especially with pred predatory dinosaurs, have have hollow limbs. I mean, today birds use that for to help with flight. But 
uh, in the in the Mesozoic, that was a, a good adaptation just to lighten the body a little bit. It helps with breathing. It helps with oxygen exchange in the body. Um, so yeah, when we look at this one particular quarry, we we keep finding parts of these dinosaurs called Allosaurus, which was kind of the T-Rex before T-Rex. Okay. And um, we have a, at least 50 of them at this one site. Wow. So was this a nest? What, what, why are That's they there? still what we're trying to figure out. Um, there's been a lot of hypotheses over the years. My favorite one, I think everybody's favorite one, was the predator trap, that you had prey animals getting stuck in the mud and the allosaurs would go in to feed on them, and then they'd get stuck, and then more allosaurs would come in, and they'd get stuck. And there are sites like this in the fossil record in Los Angeles, the La Brea Tar Pits in downtown L.A. is one of these, it's just it's full of wolves and saber-toothed cats. But the Cleveland Lloyd Quarry doesn't have any of the evidence for a predator trap other than there being a lot of predators. So what my colleagues and I have been determining over the last decade that we've been working out there uh, what we've been looking at is geochemical evidence. What's what's the chemistry of the sediment? What other fossils do we find here other than dinosaurs? And what we've uh, discovered is that the site probably doesn't represent a single dump of dinosaurs. It's probably a seasonal deposit where skeletons would wash in every year during the rainy season. And so it's mm. kind of just a big rot pit. <laughs> it probably wouldn't have smelled very good. Okay. Uh, but we we get a lot of carcasses. So maybe there was a nest nearby. There's a, still a ton of unanswered questions, but that makes it fun. Like we have a place to go back to every year and keep trying to, to pick at this mystery. You're, you're listening to UWO now. We're talking with uh, UWO Associate Professor of Geology, uh, Dr. Joseph Peterson. And we're talking about dinosaurs, the fascination that we all have with dinosaurs, and exactly what uh, Dr. Peterson does uh, in this field. You are a vertebrate paleontologist, right? which means you study their bones, as you mentioned earlier. Right. And how do these bones give us clues to what was going on during this dinosaurs period or life or during the period of dinosaurs? That's one question. And you started off talking about, we. I kind of referenced Jurassic Park, and you had a similar experience that I am and my nephew and niece mm -hmm. had. Uh, but you said some of the science has changed. So I mm -hmm. would imagine that uh, that means that this whole understanding of what dinosaurs were is all continually evolving. Absolutely. And I mean, for the for the Jurassic Park thing, um, you know, that's just how science works. And, sure. and um, unfortunately, that's, that's a hard thing for for some of us to, to remember sometimes because these these neat ideas come out. Um but they're all based on evidence. You get more evidence, you have to reevaluate. And so when Jurassic Park came out, that was the first time that anybody had seen really, you know, in popular culture, T-Rex walking with its tail sticking out the back of its body rather than dragging it like, you know, Godzilla mm -hmm. or a kangaroo. Uh, it was the first time that people had seen or really heard of Velociraptor. That wasn't a household name like it is now. But there's a number of things that um, – we know now about some of these animals that we can correct. And some of them, I mean, to, the, to most people, it's pedantic. You know, like the, 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 the cranial anatomy of T-Rex, like if we were to reconstruct a T-Rex skull today, it wouldn't look exactly like the Rex from Jurassic Park. Okay. There's some differences in angles of bones. And, and that's just from finding more specimens, doing more modeling as to how these bones fit together. Um, one of my favorites, though, is, the, uh, is, is with Velociraptor. First of all, the Velociraptor is not as big as what you see in Jurassic Park. They were actually only about like two or three feet tall. Oh, but, really? Okay. Yeah. And they were, I mean, I, I wouldn't want to fight one the same way I wouldn't <laughs> want to fight a bald eagle because they could still probably mess me up. Yeah, right. But they weren't, you know, the cunning opening doors, setting traps, doing your taxes. Oh, okay. Kind of things that we Tapping see. Tapping a movie. claw on the counter. Right. They weren't doing that kind of thing. Uh, my favorite thing, though, with, with Velociraptor, and they made it bigger because it looks good on screen, but the way they hold their arms. And again, this is a nitpicky thing, but it's kind of funny. Is if you ask anybody to do a dinosaur impersonation, they, they hold up their their hands like this. Yes. Like for for Velociraptor, they couldn't do that. Okay. Their palms faced each other, the way that a bird flaps its wings today. So literally, if 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 a Velociraptor had its palms facing down, that would have meant it had broken arms. Okay. So we like to say that, uh, as a colleague of mine in Maryland always always says, uh, they were they were clappers, not slappers. So they, they, they couldn't do this physically without breaking their arms. And again, that's something nobody cares about. But that's a little thing that over the years since 
just using Jurassic Park as like a, a, a benchmark in time, um, you've seen museums kind of correct some of the poses okay. because more of the research has, has shown that. If we were to make Jurassic Park today um, brand new based on the science today, most of the dinosaurs would have some kind of feathers or some kind of filament-like body coating. Mm-hmm. Um, there's still some we're not sure about, like the great big long neck sauropods. We're not 100% sure about their body covering. Even T-Rex itself probably wasn't totally shaggy, <laughs> but may have had some filaments coming off of the body at, at certain certain places. Uh, Velociraptor, yeah, would have been feathered. And you know that now because of finding feathers uh, at, at some of these digs? Yeah, actually we have, especially in China, a lot of the fossils that are coming out of China are in these very unique fossil beds that preserve these kind of details. They preserve skin, they preserve feathers. In some cases, you can even interpret color uh, based on the, the microscopic effects uh, in, in those fossils. And so, yeah, we, we would have to go back and reevaluate and say, wow, yeah, a lot of these things were probably feathered. Just like birds today, they would have had bright colors. You know, a lot of the Jurassic Park dinosaurs are gray or brown. In reality, mm-hmm. maybe just like modern day birds and reptiles, bright colored. Mm-hmm. So, And that's what we really do is we compare their t- dinosaurs' two most closest living relatives, which is crocodiles and birds, and to a lesser extent other reptiles. And look at what's you know, the variation we see in nature there. And if we look, we start seeing some things to compare to in the dinosaur fossil record. We're wow. talking today okay. with UWO Geology Department Associate Professor Dr. Joseph Peterson, who uh, goes on digs quite often. Is what, Annually? Sorry, your mic wasn't on. Annually? Yeah, annually. Um, so in a couple of different places, but for the last 11 years, uh, I've been working at this one particular site in Utah um, with uh, my colleague, Dr. Jonathan Warnock from the Indiana University of Pennsylvania. We both bring students out, and then we have a, a, a crew of volunteers that just come back every year. It's it's some former students that after they were done with their field course, they just, they just kept coming back. And so if they're willing to volunteer their time, that's fantastic. Uh, some people view this as, as like a, an eco vacation in a way. Um, but yeah, so doing, I've done digs there. Um, I did a lot of work in Montana for my dissertation, uh, Wyoming, the Dakotas, Canada, Mexico. Um, done some field, not dinosaur field work, but some comparable field work in Africa, looking at uh, wildlife observations and looking for behaviors to compare to what we're seeing in the fossil record. Uh, so yeah, travel quite a lot, but as far as digs go exclusively, um, yeah, the last 11 years has just been in Utah, uh, working at that main site and then looking at other sites in the local vicinity. Okay, well, take us on a site. Uh, I'm your student. What? How do we prepare for this trip, first of all? What are you telling me that do I need to bring? Uh, uh, it, depending on the time of year that we go, it, it's going to be hot, though. It, we usually go in June or July. Um, but it's the desert, so the evenings can get quite cold. So you want to plan accordingly for that. Rain isn't usually something we have to worry too much about. But and we're camping out. We're not going back to the Howard Johnson after. No, we, we're, we're lucky enough to work with the Bureau of Land Management, um, which at this particular site where we use as our base camp, there is a visitor center there. It's open for the public to come look at the site. And when we're there, we're living museum exhibits, and they can ask us <laughs> questions. Okay. Uh, there's you know an outhouse. And the visitor center has uh, solar power, so we can at least charge phones and okay. you know, camera batteries. But otherwise, yeah, we're about 30 miles from the nearest town. So in the evenings, it's just us, which is, is fantastic. And and what does the site look like? Is it roped off? How do you, you know, how do you, what is it, what, how does, uh, how does it look to the person who's never been to a site? How would you describe that? Well, the main quarry, the main Cleveland Lloyd dinosaur quarry actually has some metal sheds built over it. And there's some catwalks so people can go in and there's there's fencing so they can't jump in there. Um, but what you're going to see is a whole bunch of grayish green rock with these dark brown to black bones um, sticking out of it. And it's one of the common misconceptions about digging up bones like this, like how far down do we have to dig? And it's really not about digging down as much as it is digging into the side of a hill. Like the way mm. we find a site is we walk around and we look for bone fragments. We let nature do our job for us if we can and it erodes something out. And we find some crumbs and we'll follow a trail and see where that bone's sticking out. And then it's a matter of kind of digging into that hillside from top down and in the side so we can get a better idea of, of where things are laid out. 
it's not just randomly digging a hole in the ground and seeing what you find that okay. you know, wouldn't we wouldn't find much that way probably. Um, one of our newer sites, which is near the main quarry, was found by literally just walking around, and we were actually out looking for dinosaur footprints. And when we stopped, we both looked, my colleague and I both looked down, and we were standing on vertebrae <laughs> that had just started weathering out of the rocks. So that has been a situation where we're kind of digging into the hill and around it. Um, so as I'm picturing this in my head, you are uh, on a rock kind of, or are you not like in a foresty area? You're in a... It's, yeah, it's the desert. Okay, you're in the desert. So you're it's, it's sand, rock, that's it. Mm-hmm. You're standing now, and you find you you look down. And you there's a bone. Yeah, there's a series of vertebrae, tail vertebrae, yeah. uh, to a, a very large, long necked dinosaur. So each of these vertebrae are probably about two to three feet tall, and we're we're seeing just part of them sticking out. But you can you can see there's a sequence. So I'm like, okay, there's more here. And we immediately get down on the ground, and we. we when you're hiking around out there and you're looking for things, you want to keep some to- basic tools on you, a rock hammer, a brush, uh, some dental picks. And so we start kind of picking around a little bit to see uh, what, what what we have there. And I do want to point out that we have permits through the Department of the Interior to do this because okay. it, it's a national monument. So doing that without a permit is a felony. All right. So it's important. <laughs> you okay. don't want to just go wandering around on a national monument. It's doing with, with a chisel, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a good way to get in trouble. Um but we we started excavating a little bit, and then the next day we brought more students out because they were at our other quarries and kind of consolidated a field crew to work this particular site for a while. And, you know, it was amazing because when we first got back to camp that night, we're telling everybody about it, and everybody's kind of excited. It's a big find. And we're like, yeah, there's there's bones that are attached or articulated, and the, the so far the, the sediment on the top doesn't seem to be too hard, and the stuff's looking pretty good, and yeah, this is going to be great. Yeah, and when we get a bunch of people out there and they remove all that topsoil, mm-hmm. that's hard rock. <laughs> it was incredibly hard. It's like digging through concrete. So it's a very slow process where the rock is actually harder than the fossil bones within it. So we have to be very, very slow. So this this skeleton could take us five, six, seven years to get out. And you start chiseling? What kind of mm-hmm. tools are you using to get that um, for just basic rock removal, a rock hammer and a chisel. Uh, but when you're getting closer to the bones, you want to be a lot more careful. So we we have a lot of glues and adhesives, uh, some really thin super glue that we can paint on the bones and it'll soak in so it kind of consolidates them. And then dental picks, literally scraping with a dental pick. There's something really cool about digging up a dinosaur's jaw and you're picking at its teeth with a dental pick. Um, <laughs> that's always kind of a, a kind of a, a neat little moment. But yeah, it's it's very very slow work. And then brushing away sediment. It's it's almost like the beginning of Jurassic Park, but they make it look really easy. Yeah, <laughs> and they're just brushing away. It's yeah. Eventually we get to that point, but usually there's a lot of picking. What's the likelihood that you? find a dinosaur skeleton intact or what is usually the process you find a bone here a bone there what 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 usually happens that what what has been your typical experience almost never find articulation you almost never find a complete skeleton and and again that depends on also what you're digging up if it's a very small dinosaur like a, a something the size of a bird um that's something that could probably be buried very quickly Right. So there's a better chance of having the entire skeleton there. That means that whole animal's carcass would have been buried and left that way for over 100 million years. Mm-hmm. Now, when you're dealing with our sauropods, our long necked dinosaurs, these things can be 90 feet long. That's a hard body to hide quickly <laughs> under sediment. So there's a what we notice with a lot of those large ones is there's evidence that they sat on the surface back in the Jurassic period and started to break down before – some of these bones were buried. So you almost never find, I don't want to say absolutely never, but almost never find large skeletons like that fully complete. And that's just because parts break off, scavengers drag things away, or some bones just break down the way a cow will dissolve in a field in Mm -hmm. Wisconsin if it's not buried. Um, You'll see evidence of of bones flaking before they were buried. That means they were getting sun bleached. So these are the, the things we can interpret about that history. Okay, so this animal died. Somehow these remains got here. Maybe they flowed downstream. Maybe they were dragged by a scavenger or a predator. 
And then it started to get buried. So what are all these changes that have happened from when this animal died to finding it as a fossil? And one of the things we also be really careful about is not to add to that history was what we call discovery marks. You don't want to be whacking away at the rock with a hammer right. and you find a bone by breaking it. You've just contributed to its history, but not in a good way. Okay. <laughs> and uh, so we're talking today on UWO Now with uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Joseph Peterson, who is at the UW Oshkosh uh, Geology Department. And what he does is go out and he researches um, dinosaur bones and how that dinosaur may have died based on marks that he finds on the bones and other interesting uh, stuff that has to do with dinosaurs. Uh, so we're really happy to have him in the studio with us today and, and discussing uh, his very interesting field of work. Um, what are you working on now? Well, right now we just finished a project on uh, the skull of a, a large long-necked dinosaur, uh, an apatosaurus, sometimes called brontosaurus. It's kind of a checkered mm, yeah. history. Um, but what we're actually looking at is the teeth and the way that they replaced their teeth throughout their lives. Uh, you know, we as, as humans, we get our practice set as babies, mm -hmm. and then you get your adult teeth, and that's it. Uh, you lose those, you're done. Dinosaurs, uh, similar to modern-day crocodiles, have the ability to replace their teeth throughout life. So they'd have a tooth erupted, sticking out of the jaw. That would maybe break or get worn down and there'd be another one that would grow in its place. And by looking at the, uh, if you take one of these teeth and you cut it and polish it in half, you can see growth lines. And from there, we can start uh, getting an estimate of the rate at which they were replacing their teeth. So T-Rex would have replaced its teeth every six months to a year, something like that. A lot of the predatory dinosaurs were like that. These sauropods, for some reason, some of them are losing their teeth every month and growing oh. new ones, which means they're wearing them down. So what started— They need a dental plan. Exactly. Well, and it's built into their skull. They just keep growing new ones. Um, what what started with this project is, oh, we've got this skull. These types of skulls are rare, as we were saying before. You know, not everything preserves. And the even though these animals you know, weigh multiple tons, uh, their skulls are paper thin in some parts. They're really, really delicate. Mm. Um, we were just describing because it's a, it's a rare Apatosaurus skull— and so we decided to start CT scanning the jaws and the upper upper jaw and lower jaw. And you can see all the backup teeth still in the skull. And in some cases, you have eight teeth on reserve in one tooth socket. It almost wow. looks like, like the magazine of a handgun. You've got all yeah, these right. rounds yeah. stacked and then the one in the chamber. In this case, that would have been the one that would have been sticking out. And we noticed that in the very upper front, you have up to eight replacement teeth. But in the lower, you only have two. So that's led to more questions about, well, how the heck are they holding their heads? How are they biting at vegetation? How are they wearing their teeth down? What are they eating? And now it's starting to turn into a bigger project on ecology mm -hmm. and potential migration routes. Like where would they have been going at the time? Where do we find fossils of these types of plants? How are they holding their heads? And so, and that's, again, one of the one of the beautiful things about science is it it. It presents more questions than it answers. Yeah, right. We, we did this, this description, and it turned out good. But now we, there's more we want to know, and that description led us there. So we're looking at, at ecology, and most of the stuff I've been working on lately is, is looking at Jurassic ecology uh, in Utah and Wyoming and Colorado. So, um, so your work and the work of all folks at a dig really is not just about uncovering bones you're trying to understand the life the environment yeah of these animals yeah and dinosaur paleontology has an interesting history it started out literally just digging up bones because that's what was going to get people into a museum so in the 1800s early 1900s uh the field museum in chicago for example they got their dinosaurs by hiring uh, a guy named Elmer Riggs, right out of graduate school. Uh, this is right after the World's Fair in Chicago, the Columbia mm -hmm. Exposition. They hired Elmer Riggs, who was a mammalian paleontologist, who really wanted to do research in South America, but they said, we'll give you a job if you're willing to go out to Colorado and find us some dinosaurs to put on display because this is a new museum and we want to bring people in. And nothing against Riggs, but that was his job. Was to, it was essentially headhunting giant dinosaurs. 
And a lot of museums did this uh, because that was the, the good way of getting people's attention, bringing them in. And so some of the practices over the years back then weren't very good. It wasn't science-based. It was smash and grab. Okay. However, we've, we've, we're always improving. And so when we were talking before about like we know more about dinosaurs since Jurassic Park came out. Part of that's the techniques. We're not so quick to just blast rock away from a bone anymore because if you have an animal – and it gets and it dies and it's buried in sediment and it decomposes. Some of the chemical signature of that decomposition might still be in the rock. So we have been able to start finding more fossilized skin, fossilized feathers, uh, evidence of what colors these things may have been. And you know, if you think about the ramifications of that, animals today have certain colors because it's a role that it plays in their environment. Mm-hmm. So what were these animals doing back then in their environment? So a lot of the techniques have changed. I mean, we still use a hammer and a chisel, but we're a lot more careful with it. And we have a lot more uh, you know, uh, technology that we can utilize as well. What do we know now about the environment where these dinosaurs lived? Let's talk about where you, your site is. What did that environment look like? What do we know about it the more, beyond just you know that there was a dinosaur? Yeah, the, the Morrison Formation, which is this package of sedimentary rock, that represents the very end of the Jurassic period. So this is still before T-Rex and Triceratops, but it's when you have your big long neck dinosaurs and stegosaurs and allosaurs. It's kind of the, the, the when they really took over the world, so to speak. Um, you find this package of sedimentary rocks that we call the Morrison all out, out west, so in parts of uh, Colorado, Utah, parts of Montana, even all the way up into Canada. And... There's nowhere on the earth today that's exactly like the Morrison Formations ecosystem. The closest, and this is still wrong, (laughs) would be the Serengeti Mm. with no grass, Mm. which is weird because that's what the Serengeti is known for as an ecosystem. It's like a a sea of grass, no grass, Uh, probably somewhat monsoonal or sub-monsoonal. So you'd have dry seasons and wet seasons, Uh, a lot of conifers. So uh, pine trees, no flowers. Flowers hadn't evolved yet. Uh, No snakes, but we had lizards and frogs and salamanders. The largest mammal would have been about the size of a hedgehog. Um, Mm. So a really strange world at that time. Now you jump ahead to the Cretaceous period when things like T-Rex are running around. And that's more like the Carolinas, except it's Montana and Wyoming. (laughs) You know, it's hard. It's it's strange to go to Montana and find crocodile fossils and and find fossil palm leaves and things. But it was much more like a, a wetland that you would have seen in like you see in like the Carolinas. And a lot of this is just where the continents were at the time. What climates? What type of climate systems the planet had at that time? Um, during the late Cretaceous period, when T. Rex was around, there probably wasn't any permanent ice at the poles. Okay. may have gotten some winter snow, but there was no, like, permanent glaciers. It was that warm, and things have changed a lot in the last yeah. 67 million years. Uh, so it, very different world. The, the Jurassic stuff is really fun to play around in, though, because it's just so strange. Well, um, you've talked about a couple of spots here in the United States. What are the the dinosaur spots in the United States where there's a lot of activity in terms of Discovering bones and artifacts there, or fossils, I should say. I'd say Utah's number one in okay. the United States. Uh, there's maybe a dozen new dinosaur species described from Utah every year. Every year? Yeah. And most of them are the weird horn dinosaurs. And we, everybody knows about triceratops. You know, yeah, right. Three horns. That's one genus among dozens. Dozens of, of horned dinosaurs. Just Living the, at the same time or in different periods? Different periods. Uh, some at the same time, some at different periods, and some we're not really sure. Like, is One of the big debates going on right now, and this, again, as we learn more about these animals, is how can you tell the difference between two separate species that lived at the same time and a juvenile and an adult of the same species? Yeah. And, you know, like if, if you knew nothing about frog reproduction— You'd have a hard time believing that a tadpole is going to grow into a frog. They look so different, right? right? And we don't see that level of extreme in in dinosaur growth, but there are some really bizarre ones. One of the one of the specimens that I've I've worked on quite a lot is a juvenile T. Rex that we discovered in Montana. It's the most complete juvenile T. Rex ever found, uh, and it's currently on display in Rockford, Illinois. And 
when we first found it, we knew it was a tyrannosaur, but we weren't sure if it was T-Rex or this other tyrannosaur that had been described called Nanotyrannus, or the the, the dwarf tyrant, or the yeah. pygmy tyrant is what it is. Um, and it, the research has since shown that Nanotyrannus probably didn't exist. What people were calling Nanotyrannus was probably juvenile T-Rex. It just makes more sense. Um, and there's a lot of evidence showing that this is that these animals were still rapidly growing when they died. Uh, but those are the kind of things we have to parse out. And that's all part of an ecosystem as well. Mm-hmm. How many species do you have? Well, it depends. Which ones are we grouping to the same species and which ones are we splitting? Where else on Earth can you find a lot of dinosaurs? Uh, China. I mentioned China before in Mongolia. The Gobi Desert is a hot spot. Um, there's not as much work in South America, but some incredible stuff coming out of there. Just bizarre animals, uh, even by dinosaur standards. Uh, Alberta. Well, like Bizarre like what? Um, so in, this is one that's been featured in the last couple of Jurassic World movies. It's a, a fan favorite called Carnotaurus. So it's a meat-eating dinosaur. It's about 25 feet long. It's got arms that are even smaller than T-Rex's. It's got this kind of a squat face and horns over its eyes and little spiky nubs going all down its back. So yeah, that is really odd. strange. <laughs> and there's another one called a Margosaurus, which was a, a sauropod, so a long-necked dinosaur, but it has long spines coming down its back. So just some really strange things like that. Uh, which is probably because they were all evolving in isolation in South America. So similar to what's going on in Australia today. Now, you aren't the only one who goes on these digs. There's students that you take with you as well. Tell us about how uh, a student uh, gets to go along. Obviously, it's it's not a field trip like Mm -hmm. you have in school where your parent signs are slip. Right. It's part of their research too, I would imagine, correct? Yeah, it depends. So this past summer, uh, we actually did run a field course. For, for not just geology majors, but uh, for students that have maybe had one or two intro geology courses just so they okay. knew some of the basics of, of rock identification. Um, and what I, what I do personally, and everybody's a little different when they run a field course, but what I do isn't as much like, okay, so everybody gather around here. This is your project. And then next day, here's another project. It's, this is an active research station, active research site. We're doing a lot of different things. We're going to rotate, and you're all going to learn to do all of it. So you get that that full mm-hmm. field experience. Um, but in many times, yeah, it is a student who's coming out because they're doing a research project with me, and they're going to incorporate data from this field site into their project. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons why some of our former students keep coming back as volunteers is they're contributing. You know, They might have a 9 to 5, but this is their week of vacation, and they're going to come – be a desert rat with us and live in the middle of nowhere right. for a week or two. Uh, and they're contributing to that that research still by helping out. And sometimes it's as you know, simple as we need a couple of water jugs carried a mile out to our other site. And sometimes it's, okay, I need you to excavate this skeleton. And a lot of times it's things like, you know, there's a, a big cliff. We need to make what's called a stratigraphic column, yeah. which is describe all those different layers of rock because those layers are environments. And that tells us what came before and after what we're digging up. And so it's very comprehensive. Uh, and then in the evenings, it's it's relaxation time. You know, it's like I don't want people to be so exhausted that they can't get up the next morning. So we, we try to make dinner a big deal. <laughs> Got you. Wow. Last question. If there was, other than Utah, a place where you say, I, I'd love to go there and see what I could find, where would that spot be? Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. Um you know, I honestly, I do think that the stuff in South America is just so strange. And that also represents a time period that's not very well understood yet. So, yeah, that, that might be where I eventually start poking around. Wow. Just have to brush up on my Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. Well, thanks so much, uh, Doc, for coming by and talking to us. It's been really fun Thank exploring uh, dinosaurs with you. And uh, you'll be on more dig. You, you go, mm-hmm. like every, like I said at the beginning of the, uh, mm-hmm. the podcast, Every summer yep. or period. How long? Uh, two to three weeks. So, and some people come out for just a few days. I get it. <laughs> and you're able to find enough stuff during those couple, two or three weeks that, I mean, that seems uh, it, like a the, short period of time. This but. particular site in Utah is so dense in a concentration. It's one of the only places in the world that I can tell somebody, if you want to find a dinosaur bone, 
you're probably going to find a dinosaur bone. Wow. That becomes the problem is because we keep finding them. <laughs> All right. Well, find some more stuff for us. We'll have you back on and talk about that. But thanks so much for coming by and talking to us. Thank you very much. UWO Now. That's all the time we're going to have. We'll, we'll be back uh, with more UWO Now. Uh, stay tuned. As I mentioned earlier, you can uh, go to your favorite uh, podcasting platform and catch all of our UWO Now uh, episodes. That's all the time we got. I'm Wendell Ray. Thanks for listening. <laughs>